Governor Kathy Hochul's campaign to increase the utilization of cash bail in New York is not the only potential change to the Empire State's pretrial detention laws being considered in the extended debate over the state's budget, according to criminal justice stakeholders. The legislative leaders and governor have also considered changes to the rules governing how and when evidence is shared between prosecutors and defense attorneys, a process known as discovery, which, like bail, was dramatically changed as part of the 2019 reforms to our criminal justice system. One proposal floated in recent days comes from the Staten Island District Attorney, which would create a staggered discovery process with only evidence deemed material required to be initially disclosed by prosecutors. To discuss potential changes to the state's evidentiary discovery laws, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Kali Condliff, staff attorney with the training unit of the Criminal Defense Practice for the Legal Aid Society. Welcome to the show, Kali. Thank you so much for having me, David. So for starters, what's your understanding of the changes to the state's discovery laws that have been considered behind closed doors as part of budget negotiations in recent days and weeks, uh, but weren't included in the governor's budget proposal? Yeah. So as you said, these changes were not included in the governor's budget proposal, uh, nor were they included in the one house budgets put out by the legislature. So the precise language um, is not known to us at this point. However, uh, from our understanding, the proposal in sort of broad strokes, right, deals with um, limits on the defendant's right to bring challenges if we claim as the defense that the prosecutor has not fully complied with their discovery obligations. And just to take a quick step back, when we're talking about discovery obligations, what we're really talking about is the sharing of evidence. By evidence, I mean police reports, witness statements, surveillance video, 911 calls, right? Really basic materials that will be used at trial against our clients or may not be, may in fact exculpate our clients, might demonstrate that they are innocent or that it didn't happen the way the complaining witness said it did. So this is all material that's in the possession of the prosecutor and or the police, right? Who the prosecutor has access to. Basically, uh, the major change when it came to the reforms that were put in place in 2020 was that rather than the defense having to request what it couldn't possibly know, right, what existed, right, we don't have access to these witnesses, we don't have access to the police. And the old law required that we come up with a list of guesses, essentially, as to what might exist in the case, and demand it all from the prosecutor. And then it would require the prosecutor turn it over, but the prosecutor didn't have a time limit on that. So they could wait until the very last moment before the case was actually tried before they had to turn everything over to the defense, which for obvious reasons placed the defense in a very precarious position. We couldn't investigate our cases. We couldn't inform our clients of the full evidence against them. Uh, we couldn't prepare for trial. And it led to a number of wrongful convictions and many people taking pleas on cases before they had any information about the evidence against them in order to, because they were either sitting in jail or they were suffering from the consequences of having a case penned against them, like losing their jobs or their homes, et cetera. So this proposal um, seeks to bring us back by putting the burden back on the defense to identify what they have not been given. And if they fail to do that, if the defense fails to do that within a specified number of days, um, they will then potentially lose the right to even demand such materials or to litigate that issue. When it comes to evidence in a criminal matter, is all evidence created equal? Are, are there some documents that are uh, essentially non-material or duplicative? And if so, how do you think about the disclosure of those items? For example, do they need to be uh, turned over with the same amount of speed that you would say uh, a witness list or other sort of like more key evidence? So that's a really great question because it's something that I think a lot of people don't don't fully appreciate. You know, the fact is that until a prosecutor or a defense attorney sees the evidence, right, obtains it and sees it for themselves, they can't make that kind of judgment. Like there is not a particular category of type of document or type of recording 
that we can presume is immaterial or that is duplicative. Because, you know, for instance, I'll give you an example. Something that is often said by prosecutors in defense of these proposals is that, for instance, right, we, a lot of most police officers wear body worn cameras. And if a prosecutor, let's say they have six officers who arrive at a scene and the first three officers, they are able to obtain their body worn camera footage and they turn them over, right? But they don't, they aren't as easily able or they just don't, for whatever reason, obtain the last three body worn cameras. Um, they will claim we don't need to go get that because it's going to be duplicative of whatever is on the other officer's cameras that you already have. But the fact is, I've seen in too many cases, you know, it's that last officer's body cam that has an interview with a witness who the other officers didn't speak with, right? They don't stay glued together. And, you know, sometimes it's duplicative. Sometimes there's nothing on there of importance, but oftentimes there is. And until you actually obtain it and review it, there's no way to know. And so these proposals that would place sort of rank evidence in an order of importance or try to say you shouldn't, you know, they don't need to obtain that before they're able to, to stay ready for trial or go forward uh, really comes from a place of not appreciating that all evidence is important, not just the evidence that they intend to use to prove the charges against a person. Because often it's the other evidence that actually might serve to exculpate them or might show a different angle of the case that the prosecutor and the defense attorney were unaware of. For listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're discussing potential changes to the state's evidentiary discovery laws that are being debated and have been debated behind closed doors as part of this year's budget process. And our guest is Kali Conliffe, staff attorney for the training unit of the criminal defense practice at the Legal Aid Society. If I'm, say, a public defender, I'm overworked, overwhelmed, I've got tons of cases, not enough time to go through them all. And under current statute, if I'm getting a big bomb of information, is it likely that I'm even going to go through all of the relevant evidence that I'm going to get, say, before trial? Am I going to be able to go through five, six, seven body camera video footages? And I ask that because I'm curious whether this is really about accessing all the data or whether it's about retaining a system that results in more dismissals because prosecutors maybe aren't able to get all the information over based on timelines that exist now. Um, no, I think that absolutely a defense attorney is going to review all of the material. Now, will they be able to do it? You know, it, it really depends, first of all, on the volume of material that's turned over and on the workload of, of the attorney. And as you mentioned, right, defense attorneys are often overwhelmed with work, just like prosecutors are, which makes this idea of placing a deadline on a challenge even more concerning, right? That's the proposal that they have. Um, but of course, before any plea were entered into or any trial were to happen, we would absolutely review all of the evidence. And the fact is that we need to have access to it in order to determine what matters and what doesn't. So to limit the access because a prosecutor gets to decide what matters and what doesn't, well, guess what? We know what the consequences of that are, right? Because we've seen it for years. And the fact is that too often, that was the justification that led to a wrongful conviction. So to my mind, there is no proposal that would seek to limit the scope of what the defense is entitled to is really something that should ever be considered at this point. We cannot take a step back. Are they proposing to limit what you're entitled to or, or just the pace at which you would receive the information? They are not explicitly uh, saying, at least in the proposal that I think is being considered, that the scope would be limited. I mean, certainly in the uh, proposal that you mentioned at the top of, mm -hmm. uh, of this, the, but from the Staten Island DA, they certainly are, and other proposals that have been put out there by the DA's office uh, do. However, the effect will be the same with this proposal, because what it will do is say that if a defense attorney cannot accurately guess about the existence of an item, that that potential, the discovery of that item doesn't necessarily have to happen. 
because it will remove the incentive from a prosecutor because it will remove the consequences if they fail to obtain that item, right? By removing the consequence, you remove the likelihood that it's going to be obtained. So the concern that, that I have is that even if they don't explicitly say, you don't need to find all of the evidence that relates to the case, if a defense attorney who is over, overworked and is unable to know and have a crystal ball and know exactly what exists in a case is unable to accurately guess that certain items are missing from a disclosure, under this proposal, their right to it will then evaporate, essentially, and the prosecutor will have no more incentive to go look for it. Well, if you think about proposals then to improve the implementation of discovery, because I think on both sides of this issue, there's a consensus that it has not been a perfectly run program since 2020. What could the state do to smooth out the implementation? I think that the clear solution is funding, right? This law was passed initially without being funded. And last year, the funding that was provided didn't go to New York City district attorneys, which is desperately needed. Uh, also, the defense has not received any funding. With I think if both sides were actually fully funded, this conversation wouldn't be happening because we would be able to fulfill all of our obligations in a timely manner on both sides. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I believe the governor has put in her budget all of the funding that the uh, prosecutors have asked for. And now they're seeking to get these changes to the law before they see whether or not that funding that they have been saying they so desperately need, and we agree they desperately need, would actually work to ameliorate the concerns that they have. Because the old dynamic of evidentiary discovery was so beneficial to prosecutors, I'm wondering if you think that there is a culture change that needs to be addressed as well in New York, or whether you think just putting money at this will result in an embrace of the discovery timeline by prosecutors? That's a great question. While I think money is absolutely necessary, I absolutely agree that a change of culture, a change of perspective is needed. Unfortunately, too often, prosecutors approach this with the assumption that there isn't anything out there that could change their view of a case, right? So they obtain one or two pieces of evidence that they see as consistent with the allegations. And then after disclosing that, feel that anything more is, is the defense being picky, right? As opposed to understanding that this comes from a place of wanting to ensure that this person is being prosecuted fairly and making sure that there isn't something else going on in the case. And if I can just give you one brief example, we had a case in our office prior to the reforms that I think shows exactly what sort of culture we were dealing with and we continue to deal with. And that was a case where a client of ours was accused of gang assault, which comes with the potential of about 25 years in prison. And he was a first arrest, no record, father, hardworking guy. He lost all of that when he was wrongfully accused of gang assault. And from the beginning, he was telling his lawyer that he wasn't guilty, that he was not the person who had assaulted the complaining witness. And the prosecutor made representations that there was a video that proved that he had done it from the beginning. But under the old laws, there was no incentive for the prosecutor to provide that video at any point during the trial, right? They would have to provide it during the pendency of the case. Right. They'd have to provide it before in order to use it at trial. But they were trying to extract a plea from him, right? They wanted him to plead guilty to five years. After many, many requests from the defense, they finally said, oh, the video doesn't exist now because it's unviewable, it's been corrupted. Eventually, after even more requests and a year and a half into the case, when the case was about to be sent out for trial, they turned the video over. Sure enough, it wasn't corrupted, it was viewable, and it turned out that it demonstrated that he was innocent, exactly as he had said from the very beginning, he was nowhere near where the actual fight that led to this person's injuries took place. And the prosecutor, it turned out, had not even viewed the video. So while they were making all of these representations and relying on things said to them by the police, they had not themselves viewed the evidence. And of course, the next day they come back 
and they end up dismissing the case. A year and a half later, after our client had lost his job, had lost his family, had lost his home, and had been incarcerated for a time. That is sort of typifies the dynamic that we're talking about and the culture and the attitude of many prosecutors towards discovery and, and the way that they view their obligations. And so again, my concern is that we roll back this law in any way, we risk returning to a system that allows things like that to happen. And that example is emblematic of what happens and not an anomaly in the system? It's absolutely emblematic. I mean, obviously not everybody has such a dramatic and obvious sort of set of circumstances, but I cannot tell you the number of, of clients that I represented when I was working uh, in the Bronx as a, as a defense attorney who would not get a shred of their evidence for years or would get very basic police reports early in the case. And then whether they were incarcerated or they were out, they would have to wait for over a year, if not two, to see the evidence in their case. Sometimes it would be something that seemed minor on its face, like you would have the wrong address, right? That in the complaint that I got at, at the arraignment, it would say one address. And I would go and try to do an investigation to find exculpatory video because my client was claiming that they were not the person who did this thing. And then, although there wasn't video collected by the police, there was a different address in the police reports from the address that was listed in the complaint when I ultimately received the discovery a year and a half into the case. And had I known at the time that it didn't take place where they originally said it did, I would have been able to go and get potentially exculpatory video, right? So it has impacts beyond just the hiding of explicitly exculpatory evidence. Without full access to the discovery, you cannot know what you don't know as a defense attorney or a defendant. And so you're placed in a really impossible situation where you're unable to fully investigate the charges against you, unable to take an informed plea or choose to go to trial. And there's really no reason for it, right? If we fund these laws, they can be implemented perfectly easily in my view. Well, we've been speaking with Kali Conliff. They're a staff attorney with the training unit of the Criminal Defense Practice at the Legal Aid Society. Kali, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information.